Hi, welcome to our online service. At Cross Community Church, it's our mission to grow up as disciples of Christ, to grow together through fellowship with other believers, and to grow out by sharing the good news of Jesus with our community and around the world. Now, let's worship together. If someone would have told me how good my life would get, I would have called him crazy, cause I couldn't see it yet. From a story going nowhere, to where I'm standing now, I'm smiling cause I know there's only one way now. How good, how good, how good a God, my heart can't help but see. My sins have been forgiven, my wrongs have been erased. I've learned what's so amazing about amazing grace. Yeah, this life I live is proof that every prayer I prayed was heard. Lord, ain't it just like you to give me more than I deserve? How good, how good, how good a God. Time to leave this earth Lord, ain't it just like you To give me more than I deserve How good, how good, how good a God My heart can't help but see How good, how good, how good a God To be so good to me and pray.
with shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble. One thing 
sing it one more time. You're the God of the breakthrough. When I'm breaking down, you'll be working a way through. And there's no way out. This one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So whatever I'm feeling, I've still got a reason. Come on and praise him.
is so good. You know, I could ask you this morning, how are you feeling? You might say good. You might not say good. But if I ask you, is God good? Then we must answer with a resounding yes. Because no matter how we're feeling, no matter what's going on, whether we're confused or sick or tired, frustrated, anxious, it's in God's hands. And he is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And that's why we're here today, to worship him for his goodness to us. Amen? Can we just lift one more shout of praise to God for his goodness? Thank you, God. And I'm sure we've got some new faces around us, so let's step out and greet one another. Make everybody welcome this morning. As you are taking your seats, I just want to welcome all of you to Cross Community Church. I'd like to welcome our online viewers as well. We're so glad that you are tuning in today. Um, my name is Kimmy Barnett, for those of you that may not know me, and I do have the privilege of serving on staff here at Cross Community Church. Um, Cross Community is a great place to call home. It's also a great place to work. Um, if you are new with us this morning, maybe this is your first time to church in a long time or you're looking for a new church home, whatever your reason is, we're so glad that you're here. Church, can we please welcome all of our guests this morning? If you are new, um, we would really love to connect with you. So I just want to encourage you to take a moment and fill out our in-touch card. Maybe there's an area in your life that we can pray for. We also want to get you plugged into our weekly e-news. Hold on to it. And then as you exit today, you can put that in our tithing box or you can take that to our welcome desk where you'll be greeted by a friendly face and you'll have a small gift to take home. Giving is an important part of our worship service. It is also a personal act of worship. And we have three ways that you can give. We don't take an uh, in-service offering, but if you brought your tithe or your offering with you this morning, whether that be cash or check, there are giving envelopes in front of you in the seat back pocket. You can use that. Um, or you can um, drop that directly in our tithing boxes. There's two of them. They're located at the back of our worship center today. The second way that you can give is to go to our website, crosscommunity.cc, and you click on the Give tab. One advantage to giving online is that you can set up reoccurring payments, um, so whether that be each week or each month, uh, but just we want you to be cognizant that if you choose to give online using a credit card, whether that be a Visa, MasterCard, or Amex, the church does inquire a small 2 or 3% fee. So if you're able to pay using your bank account, um, we certainly would appreciate that. And then our third way to give is using the app Venmo. It's free and it's secure. You just download it to your phone, you set up your bank account, and then it's just a couple clicks and you can give directly to the church that way. Happening two weeks from today, we are having a water baptism right here during our 10 a.m. service. That's Sunday, March 12th. Um, what a water baptism is, it's your public proclamation of your faith in Christ. So if you have surrendered your life to the Lord and you have not been baptized, maybe this is an opportunity for you to do so. So if you'd like more information or you want to talk to one of our pastors, you can do one of two things. You can stop by the welcome desk after service. They'll take all your information. Or you can email kim at crosscommunity.cc. And finally, this is our last Sunday for our February mission. So if you'd like to participate with First Care, um, you can check your bulletin for more information there. And then we just also ask that you keep Alex, Ebiola, and his family, our global missions partners, in your prayers. Those are all the announcements I have. So let's continue in our worship with scripture reading and prayer. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. Brothers and sisters, we are gathered here just to pay homage and to give God praise for his mercies towards us. The scripture lesson will be taken from Romans 12 verses 1 to 2. Let us stand as we read it together. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Let's honor God's word by saying thanks be to God. 
We'll be having the prayer by my wife, Sister Del. Lift your hands and worship God, church. Let us lift our hands and give God thanks for his goodness because he's worthy. Open your mouth if you're able to and tell him thank you for this new day. We thank you, God, for your presence. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. And so, mighty God, we come before you, Father. We invite you, Holy Spirit, in our midst. We invite you to tabernacle with us today. Come, Holy Spirit, we need you. Come, sweet spirit, we pray. Come with your strength. Come with your power. Come in your own gentle way. We need a touch this morning. Father, we thank you that this is the day that you have made. And you charge us to rejoice and be glad in it. Glad in it. We are glad not because everything is good. But we are glad as our brother remind us because you are alive and well. You are holding our hands through every difficulty. So today, mighty God, we invite your Shekinah glory in our midst. We ask you to minister to our every needs. Meet us at the point of our needs. We come with broken hearts. We come with minds that we come with minds that need healing. We come with depression. We come with wounds God but we understand and we know that there's power in the blood of Jesus and so mighty God we ask that you minister to our every need bless the praise team as they minister to us God that healing will come through the singing bless Pastor Randy as he minister to us God that healing will come through the words that they that he's ministered to us through Father you said how can a young man cleanse his way but by taking heed of the word of God help Help us, God, to hear, Lord God. Help us to have listening ears today, God, that we will leave, God, with our cups full and running over, that we will go out into the highways and byways and tell others of you, that we will let our neighbors, our, our co-workers, those around us know that you are alive and that you heal. You are the resurrected Lord. You are the great King. And so, mighty God, we bless you and we thank you for this new day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
that you are with us.
lift up your hands and worship Him. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the Today, you're going to hear from God's Word about when Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit. If the world is as bad as we believe it is, we need to have hope. We need to have courage. We need to have a message that lets us know that from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands our destiny. He's in control. If I didn't believe the Bible, if I didn't believe that Christ was who he said he was, if I didn't believe that Christ died on a cross, was buried, was raised from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven, if I didn't believe that he was at the right hand of the Father ever living to make intercession for all of those who trust in him, if I didn't believe that Christ was coming again to bring to history God's predetermined end, I'd really have no hope in the world in which I live, and neither would you. The other day I spoke with somebody, and I said, hey, have you been following the news? And they said, no, I don't watch the news anymore because everything is bad. I said, yeah, but you know the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is in complete control of everything. When I read the Bible, I am reminded that God is orchestrating the history of the world and he's moving the events of history toward a predetermined prophetic end. And he's directing the nations of the world. He's directing the political ups and downs of the world. He brings kingdoms into reign and he brings kingdoms down. He rules over all the economies, good, bad, and indifferent. And also, he reigns and rules over my life and yours, which lets me know that if he's directing the history of the world, and he is, then he's also directing my life, and he's also directing your life. And this morning, I want to direct your attention to a passage of Scripture in John's Gospel, where Jesus told his disciples that the Holy Spirit was going to come. And that when he came into their life, he was going to guide them and he was going to direct them. John chapter 16 is part of what is known as the farewell discourse. The farewell discourse was Jesus' discourse and conversation with his disciples in the upper room. Now, Jesus came for a purpose. His purpose was not to establish an earthly political kingdom. His disciples thought that he was going to overthrow the rulers of Rome, that he was going to set up an earthly kingdom, and that he was going to position them as these great political leaders. And so they thought that he was going to do something that fits their agenda. But Jesus corrected them time and again and said, I didn't come to do the will of man, I came to do the will of the Father. And over and over again in the Gospels, he reminded his followers that he was going to Jerusalem in order to die on a cross, in order to redeem sinful humanity. He told them, I'm going to be mocked, I'm going to be scourged, I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be ridiculed, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to die on a cross, and then I'm going to be raised by the power of the Father through the work of the Holy Spirit on the third day, and then I'm going to ascend, and at the end of the age, I'm going to come again, and I'm going to establish my heavenly kingdom on this earth once and for all. But they didn't get it, and so he told them once again, I'm going to die. And when I leave you, 
God the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to lead you and guide you into all truth. This farewell discourse was Jesus' attempt to give the disciples good theology. And I can think of nothing more important today in the modern day 21st century church than for the people who attend the church to have good theology. Now you're here today and you might say, yeah, but that theology business, that's for those of you who are men of the cloth, uh, those of you who are pastors and those of you who teach the Bible. Well, you know, the word theology is a compound word existing of the word theos and the word ology. Theos referring to God and ology referring to the study of God. Everyone in this building today is a theologian because you study about God and you think about God and you muse about God and you have moments of contemplation where you're contemplative about the attributes of God and you talk to other people about God. And I hope that today you and I are on a journey of improving our theology and basing our understanding of God on his revealed word. Because if we base our understanding of God on emotions, well, you know how that could lead you and me. It could lead us astray. If you base your understanding of God simply on things you hear on the radio or books that you read, your understanding of God may or may not be a good understanding. But when you read a passage of scripture like this, when you're reading the very words of Jesus as, recording, as recorded by John, as you read the Bible, you hear the word of God. This is the word of God. And the flowers of the field, they fade away, and the grass withers, but not the words of my Lord. They endure forever. So today, I want us for the next few moments, I want us to listen to how Jesus introduced the person of the Holy Spirit. I don't pretend to assume that in the next few moments I can do an exhaustive treatment of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. I could preach the rest of my life and probably only skim the surface of what scriptures have to say about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. But today, I want to give you enough to where you can leave here today and you will be in awe of the Holy Spirit and that you will allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life and to bring about a deeper understanding in your life of the person of Jesus Christ. Remember the context. He's in the upper room, and he's getting ready to be crucified. He knows he's going to leave. And this is what he said to his disciples, beginning in verse 12 of John chapter 16. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Jesus said, when I leave, the Father is going to send the comforter. He's going to send someone in my place. Jesus was essentially telling his disciples that the Holy Spirit in you is better than me being beside you. Now they wanted Jesus to remain on this earth forever, but Jesus had a mission to accomplish, to die on the cross and to ascend into heaven. And in his place would come what the New Testament calls the paraclete, the comforter, the advocate, the helper, the guide, the person of the Holy Spirit. When you read John chapter 15, 16, and 17, you understand that Jesus had a lot to say about the role of the Holy Spirit, about the person of the Holy Spirit. There is a movement today. <clears throat> it is sweeping evangelicalism. It is sweeping seminaries and Bible institutes. There's a, an agenda today to feminize the Trinity to refer to the Holy Spirit as a she, to take out of context the clear words of our Savior, who when he referred to the Holy Spirit, did not speak of the Holy Spirit in feminine ways, 
did not feminize the Trinity, did not feminize the Father, did not feminize the person of the Holy Spirit. But when Jesus spoke of the Holy Spirit, he referred to him as he. He did not refer to the Holy Spirit as an it, as a concept, as the imagination of one's thinking, but he referred to the Holy Spirit as a person. And this morning, as we consider what Jesus said in introducing the Holy Spirit, I want us also to look at the broader context of the Bible, and I want us to understand who the Holy Spirit is. At least, I want us to understand an elementary approach to the person of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit intends to accomplish as as he brings about God's plan of redemption. First of all, when we consider the Holy Spirit, we are reminded that the Holy Spirit is God and that God the Holy Spirit is a person. This is of monumental significance for a church like ours. We are in the Pentecostal tradition. We believe in the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. I encourage people when they talk to me in private, I encourage people to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit and to allow the person of the Holy Spirit to guide and govern and direct every aspect of their life. When Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit, he referred to the Holy Spirit as a person. This is crucial because oftentimes we hear people say, do you have it? Have you received it? It was really present in the service today. I know all about it. Well, the Holy Spirit is not an inanimate object. The Holy Spirit is not a concept. The Holy Spirit is not some force floating around in the Milky Way. The Holy Spirit is not some figment of my imagination or yours. According to the Bible, the Holy Spirit is God and He is a person. In order to be a person, you have to be able to think and you have to be able to have a will and you have to have the ability to reason and you have to have the ability to make decisions and you have to have the ability to communicate. And the Holy Spirit is able to do all of that because the Holy Spirit is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. Push pause for just a moment. I would encourage every one of you in here today to begin to thank the Holy Spirit for His grace in your life, to be able to worship the Holy Spirit, to praise the Holy Spirit, to seek the presence of the Holy Spirit, to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to seek the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God the Holy Spirit is a person. How do I know this? Well, scriptures are replete with examples of the personhood of the Holy Spirit, but I want to direct your attention to two specific passages this morning. The first being in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. In the book of Ephesians, Paul gives a doctrinal treatise to the plan of salvation and the redemptive grace of God in the first few chapters. He goes from deep doctrine to everyday living. Paul was such a tremendous teacher of God's word because he dealt with the reality of the deep things of God and then the practicality of those deep things of God working out in the life of those in the church at Ephesus. In other words, he dealt with what they should believe and then he told them, in light of your belief, this is how you ought to behave. And in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is giving a number of pragmatic applications to what the Christians in the church at Ephesus should be behaving based on their belief. And this belief should impact their relationships with their children, their relationships if they're married with their spouse, their relationship with those who they work with, their relationships in the community. In other words, Paul says that what you say and how you act and what you think 
and how you respond is a direct correlation with what you believe. And Paul went on to say that we have to get rid of bitterness and anger and wrath and jealousy and lust and greed and covetousness because if not, here's the warning in verse 30 of Ephesians 4, you will grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Have you ever grieved him? I promise you, you have. Have I ever grieved him more times than I'm willing to admit? When I read the Bible, and by the way, I say this every week, please read the Bible. There is no other way that you will grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ apart from reading the Bible. And when you read the Bible, you're going to be looking at a spiritual mirror. And the Bible is going to get to the very essence of who you are. It's going to get beyond the makeup, the foundation that you put on your face, the gel you put in your hair, the makeup and the clothing that you wear, any cosmetics that you use to enhance your figure and your perception of how people see you. The Holy Spirit gets down to the essence of who you are. He deals with the heart. And I'm not talking about that cardiothoracic organ that sits in your chest that pumps blood everywhere in your body. I'm talking about the heart as the Bible sees the heart, the very seedbed of your will and of your volition and of your emotions. And when you read the Bible and you realize that God expects us to act in certain ways and think in certain ways and talk in certain ways and behave in certain ways, you realize, like I do, that you have miserably missed the mark and you've grieved the Holy Spirit of God. So what do you do? You repent and you grow and you learn what you need to do and what you need not to do. This is what Paul said, do not grieve the Spirit of God. If he was a force or a thing or an idea, it would be impossible to grieve him. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talked to the Corinthian church in chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. You know, the church at Corinthian, the church at Corinth was just a church that was so worldly. And yet God didn't give up on them. But God certainly dealt with them. The church at Corinth was this metropolitan church that was located at the crossroads of the ancient world located in this city that would be like a modern day New York or London or Paris. It was this city that was overrun with sexual immorality and paganism. And in the midst of that, God established a church and he called that church to be holy. But yet many of the people in the church begin to acquiesce to the ways of the world. Sexual immorality crept into the church. And Paul said, if you don't deal with this, I'm going to deal with you. Paul said, if you don't repent of this and deal with the person who's living this way, then when I get there, you're going to find me behaving in a way that you're not going to like. In other words, sexual immorality was such a serious sin that Paul said, deal with it. And if you don't, I'm going to deal with it as an apostle when I get there. The Apostle Paul is writing and correcting them, and he's telling them to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to allow the Holy Spirit to guide them. And in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says that God has given us things that the ear cannot hear and the eye can't see and the mind can't even comprehend. I mean, sure, we can think about heaven and we can read the Bible, but we need the Spirit of God to really help us to understand the deep things of God. And this is what he said in this passage of Scripture. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for the spirit of that person which is in him. So also, one comprehends the thoughts of God only through the spirit of God. Or in other words, no one can comprehend the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, who is a person. And this is why, brothers and sisters, that when you read the Bible prayerfully, carefully, systematically, humbly, 
when you gather in a worship service with like-minded believers on the Lord's Day, or you gather together in someone's home during the week for prayer, or you gather together in a Bible study on Wednesday or Tuesday or Thursday or whatever night it is, and you gather around the very epicenter of truth, which is the Bible, the Holy Spirit begins to work and to deal and to present the truth. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God, and He is a person who is able to communicate the deep things of God and to make them known to the spirit of man. This is why Jesus said to the Holy Spirit, or to the disciples, I'm going to be leaving, but don't worry. The Holy Spirit in you is going to be better for you than me beside you. I don't understand what I'm about to say totally. I can explain it to you the best I can, but I still don't comprehend, but I accept by faith how Jesus Christ was 100% man and 100% God. Because he was 100% man, he placed limitations on himself and could be only at one place at one time. But because he was God, he had all power. But in the God-man, somehow or another, Jesus laid aside his divinity without divesting himself of his full nature as a God, as God, and yet he placed limitations on himself so that he could now say, I'm going to be leaving and going to the Father, and the Father's going to send the Holy Spirit, who's going to be everywhere at one time, and he's going to dwell in the hearts and lives of those who believe, in other words, those who are part of the church. So the Holy Spirit, who is a God, is a person. But the Holy Spirit, who is God, is also all-powerful. He's not some wimpy thought that we should give acquiescence to every now and again when we have goosebumps or we feel something really stirring in our heart because we've heard a good song or we've been encouraged or whatever the case may be. No, the Holy Spirit is God. He's a person and he's all-powerful. How do I know this? Well, throughout the Bible, we are told that God exists as the Father and as the Son and as the Holy Spirit. Three in one. In fact, I want to direct your attention this morning to a couple of passages of Scripture. One is the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now in verse 2, which is on the screen, and I'm going to get to in just a moment, tells us a little bit about what the Holy Spirit was doing at this time. But I want you to push pause and I want you to think about something. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit... God the Holy Spirit who is a person, God the Holy Spirit who is all-powerful according to the revealed Word of God, was directly participating in the creation of heaven and earth. This baffles me. I don't comprehend it. I can't fully understand it. But I know that this is what the Bible teaches. Recently, I was listening to a group of agnostics and atheists speak about their scientific worldview. And by the way, I think it's very good for believers who are firmly rooted in the truth of God's Word to be very conscious and aware of the worldviews held by the society at large. I was listening to a professor of biology, a professor of physics, and a professor of chemistry I don't really understand any of those disciplines, but I certainly do like to listen to the experts in those areas. And they were giving all of these theoretical constructs to explain the creation of man, to explain the creation of the heavens and the Milky Way and the and the supernova and the galaxies, and they were trying to give all of these theoretical reasons why we can absolutely be certain that evolution is the only way to make sense of everything around us. But when I read the Bible, I read a totally different narrative. I read a story that was penned by men as they were moved upon by the Holy Spirit to give us an understanding of how this all came into being. 
It is because of God, the Holy Spirit, that we today have a universe. It is because of the creative power and the work of the Holy Spirit that you exist and that I exist. In fact, in verse 2 of Genesis 1, we read something that is very profound, that even after God created the heavens and the earth, we read that the earth was without form and it was void and darkness was over the face of the deep, but the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In other words, the Holy Spirit as an all-powerful person and member of the Trinitarian Godhead was present during the creation of the heavens and the earth, and he is the one that brought meaning out of chaos. He is the one that brought uniformity out of voidness. Now, I'm going to give you a word. You might want to write this down. It's a word that theologians use. It's called ex nihilo. It, it's a Latin word that means out of nothing. That out of nothing came everything. Because the creative power and the person of the Holy Spirit brought it into existence. And he was involved in your creation as well. Oh, well, I thought I came as a result of the union of my mom and dad. That is true, but who do you think brought the human race into being? There's a passage in the Old Testament found in Job, chapter 33, when Job was contemplating the vastness of God, when he was contemplating the power of God. In Job chapter 33, verse 4, this is what Job says. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty is the one that gives me life. We need more of the Holy Spirit, not less. Not just to have a prayer language where we can pray in tongues. Not just so we can have a wonderful service. Those things are important. And I would encourage all of you to seek both. But we need the work of the Holy Spirit because without the Holy Spirit, we would cease to exist. That's how dependent we are upon the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus said, I'm going away, but I don't want you to worry because the Father is going to send someone in my stead to guide you, he's referring to the God, the Holy Spirit, who is a person. God, the Holy Spirit, who is all powerful. And let me just ask you a question today. If you were honest with yourself, if you were really honest with yourself, if you were really willing to just get alone between you and God and admit your frailties, admit your sins, admit your weaknesses, admit your brokenness, you would be a prime candidate for the power of the Holy Spirit to rise up in your life and to give you power that you have never experienced before in your life. And I'm not just speaking to you based on an experience. And yes, I have experienced this. I'm referring more so to the truth of God's word. Now, we've in these scriptures understood a little bit about the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. But there must have been more that Jesus wanted these disciples to understand. And that's why we need to consider just for a moment God the Holy Spirit's purpose in the plan of redemption. You know, you and I today are participants in God's plan of redemption. Did you, did you know that? I mean, when you read the Old Testament, and by the way, I've said it before, but let me say it again. You need to read the Bible. <laughs> I know this sounds like a broken record, but I, I feel compelled. I really do. I feel compelled every week to get up in front of the church and drone on and on about the necessity of reading the Bible. But as you read the Bible, you're going to find that God worked in the lives of broken people. Read the Bible. That's all he had to work with is brokenness and failures. And by the way, that's all he has to work with when you come to him. And that's all he has to work to when I come to him. Just broken people who have nothing but their sins to bring to him. But when we bring them in humility and in repentance, he 
places the Holy Spirit within our life and it gives us power, power to overcome. There is an epidemic today. I read the statistics. I talk to people. There is an epidemic of pornography today pervading the church, primarily among men. But I'm finding as I read statistics, there's a growing epidemic of pornography viewing among women. I don't understand that, but I know what the psychologists and the psychiatrists are telling us. I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit can help you and set you free from that. The Holy Spirit can bring about a power that gives you the power to overcome that because the Holy Spirit wants to be personally involved in your life and in mine. And there is a purpose in the work of the Holy Spirit. What is the purpose in redemption that the Holy Spirit plays? Number one, the Holy Spirit brings us to repentance. We read about this in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. I want you to listen to God's word this morning in this passage of scripture, because in John chapter 16, beginning in verse 8, we read something that reminds us of the role of the Holy Spirit. This is what he says, beginning in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, but if I do go away, the helper, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he's going to convict the world. He's going to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, and concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, when you come to Christ, and I trust that all of you have, you didn't come to Christ because you thought it was a good idea. I personally believe that the Bible teaches that we are totally depraved, not capable of coming to God, apart from the prevenient grace of God working on our life through the Holy Spirit, convincing us that we have broken the law and that we need to be redeemed. And this text tells us, that the Holy Spirit's job is to convict us. Of course, that's just one of many of his responsibilities. But we read in the Bible also that the Holy Spirit indwells us. Now, this ought to be something today that so invigorates your spiritual inner being that you leave here today with an acute awareness that you belong to God, that you're his. Here's what we read in the Bible. I'm not talking about how you feel. I'm talking about a fact. Here's what we read in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. The Apostle Paul says, In him also, Jesus, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed on him, that's the question. That is the operative question that you've got to answer. That's the $64,000 question. Have you believed? not a cognitive assent to think about God, but have you cast your eternal soul on him? Because if you have, here's what happened the moment that occurred. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of your inheritance until the day we acquire possession of it to the praise of the glory of Jesus Christ. In other words, when Jesus saved you, he put the Holy Spirit in your heart. That Greek word is the word from which we get the word down payment. He made a down payment on you and he owns you. He knows you. Oh, this is one of many reasons. One of many reasons you don't need to fear death. Because if you know Christ, the moment you die, your soul is going to go be with Jesus. Your body, wherever it is that you determine it will be laid, it will be there. In time, it will decompose. 
But remember, Jesus gave you the Holy Spirit. He put his stamp of ownership on you. He's going to find you when he comes again. And when he comes again, he's going to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He's going to raise you from the dead. Why? Because he's given you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to raise your body. He's going to reunite your body with the soul that is in the presence of the Lord. And you're going to be given a new body that's conducive for heaven and conducive for eternity. And it's all going to be for the praise of God's glory. That is the truth. Psychologists tell us there are two fears that we all have. The fear of public speaking and the fear of death. And I'm helping you right now to overcome your fear of death by simply presenting to you the Word of God. Receive it. But there's something else the Holy Spirit does. He also sanctifies us. Oh, this is what produces holiness in the life of the church. This is an old-fashioned word that we really don't like talking about in the modern church. We would rather be able to acquiesce to sin and feel good about it. We would rather be able to capitulate to the culture and just say, well, the culture, everybody's doing it. So why can't we do it? Well, there's a myriad of reasons primarily that when we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, there is a process known as sanctification that starts occurring in our life. And the word sanctification is an old-fashioned word that means I'm set apart. What does that mean? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11 tells us precisely what it means. There were people in the church who were dabbling in sexual immorality. They were cohabitating together before marriage. God's Word says don't do that. Some of them were transgressing and living in sexually loose lifestyles. God's Word says don't do that. But the Corinthian culture put a stamp of approval approval on it. So some in the Corinthian church said, well, the society's doing it, therefore it must be okay. And God says, no, it's not okay. And in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul makes it abundantly clear that those who practice sexual deviance and sexual immorality of any kind without repentance, without change, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible says. But then he brings hope. And he says to those in his audience, and such were some of you. I look forward to the day when the kingdom of God has people in this church repenting of same-sex attraction, repenting from living together before marriage, repenting from sexual looseness, repenting from all of these sins and coming to the Lord and coming and are now part of the church. That's the beauty of the gospel because God gives all of us an opportunity. Can someone this morning say amen? God is so good to us and he's so faithful. And this is what he says, and such were some of you there were a bunch of people in the Corinthian church that before their conversion were nothing more than a bunch of deviant, sexual, perverse people. And God saved them, and he saved you, and he saved me, and he saves anybody who will come. And this is what the text says. And such were some of you, but now you've been washed. Now you've been sanctified. Now you've been justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And we need less of the Holy Spirit? Oh, no, we need more of the Holy Spirit working in our life and working in our church, working in my life and working in yours. But he also not only sanctifies us, he also guides us. How does he guide us? The passage that I read to you at the very beginning of this message reminds us exactly how he guides us. According to John 16, beginning in verse 12, when Jesus went into heaven, the Father sent the Spirit to come, and as we have learned, to indwell us in order to guide us into all truth. Not to present another truth. No, 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 no. There's not any more truth than what is revealed in the Bible. The work of the Holy Spirit is to reveal that truth on an increasingly deeper level. In other words, as the Holy Spirit works in your life and mine, he gives us a deeper understanding of Jesus. 
as our sin bearer, as our spirit baptizer, as our savior, as our healer, and as our soon coming king. Jesus said, you need that. I need it. The modern day church needs it. We need the spirit of truth to come in his fullness and his power to guide us into the deep, deep things of God. Have I said to you already today that you need to read the Bible? <laughs> because the Spirit of God will not work in your life apart from the truth of God's Word. This is why people get so misled. This is how cults begin. This is how people get misdirected and misguided because I'm going to tell you something and I say this in love and I want you to get the essence of my heart the flesh in every one of us cries out for continual affirmation cries out for affection cries out for meaning cries out for belonging for purpose and if we don't find that in the truth of God's word, our flesh will go search for it somewhere else. And the devil is a master at leading us away and leading us astray to get fulfillment in our life out of something other than Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father and the truth of God's word. And that is why he said, I must leave because the Holy Spirit is going to come along and he's going to guide you into deep, deep truth. But there's something else I want to leave you with today. And as I talk to you about this, I'm just going to go ahead right now and ask you to stand. Because in the book of Acts, we're told in chapter 1, verse 8, that the Holy Spirit, who is God, who is a person, who is all-powerful, the Holy Spirit who works to convict us of our sin and to bring us into repentance, to indwell us, to sanctify us, to guide us. He is the person who gives us power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will jump around in the church. No, that's not what the text says. You might get excited and jump around. There's nothing wrong with that, so long as it's not distracting the worship of others. But that's not what the text says. The text says that you'll be witnesses unto me. Let me remind you today of why you exist. You exist to bring God glory. You exist to bring God praise. You exist for the express purpose of being a witness. Don't answer this out loud. It's a rhetorical question. And plus, I would never want to embarrass anyone because the reality is every one of us in here would probably have to raise our hand, including yours truly. <laughs> Can you think of someone today you need to forgive? Can you think of someone today that you harbor bitterness toward, unforgiveness toward? Can you think of some attitude that you know has so gripped your heart that it is impacting your testimony? Can you think of some bitterness or resentfulness down in your soul? Of course you can, because all of us have to deal with these things. But when you come to God in humility and repentance and declaring your dependency upon Him, the Holy Spirit gets involved in your life and He gives you power. You know, I used to think that power meant going and standing on the side of the street and telling people to turn or to burn. And that was such immaturity on my part. It was such a misinterpretation of Scripture. Sometimes I do see people doing that, and if that's what God's called them to do, may He be with them. That's not my calling. But when I think about the power to be a witness, I think about the power to bear fruit. Not just the power to manifest the spiritual gifts, also important in the body, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith. They're sorely lacking in my life most of the time. But may the Holy Spirit help me, and I know that He will, and may the Holy Spirit help you 
and He will. We hope you'll join us in person for one of our services. Every Sunday, we meet at 8 a.m. in Palm Beach Shores and at 10 a.m. in Palm Beach Gardens. You can find more information on our website, crosscommunity.cc, or on Facebook and Instagram, at Cross Community Church. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great week.